So uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening once again, and depending on whatever part of the world we have logged in today from, and welcome to the second installment of the Mysteries of the Universe Institute Lecture Series, or MOU ILS in short, of the Indian Institute of Technology, Roorkee, India. So without further ado, I request our Deputy Director, Professor Manoranjan Parida, to kindly say a few words. Professor Parida, please. Thank you, Professor Misa. First, uh, good, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and to all those uh, who are in this uh, interesting lecture series. First of all, I would like to extend a warm welcome to Professor Sir Anthony J. Laggett on behalf of IIT Roorkee. So today is a special event of our Institute lecture series because of the presence of uh, Professor Leggett. Professor Sir Anthony James Leggett has uh, been a recipient of Nobel Prize in Physics in 2003. And uh, for organizing this event, I appreciate the collaboration of Professor T.B. Ramakrishnan, then uh, our student members from Students Technical Council, IIT Roorkee, Indian Physics Association, IIT Roorkee. And I'm sure we all, all have an interesting session uh, uh, because of the lecture of Professor Leggett. So without taking much time, I once again extend a warm welcome to Professor Leggett and all the attendees of today's lecture. So thank you, Professor Misra. Uh, thank you so much, Professor Parida. So before I introduce, or at least try to introduce our extremely distinguished speaker and request him to kindly deliver the inaugural lecture of the MOU ILS2 lecture series, uh, I just wanted to uh, 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 push in, if I may, a few words about the inception of MOU ILS2 itself. So the Mysteries of the Universe Institute Lecture Series 1, i.e. MOU ILS1, was uh, held last year during the period October 17th through November 27th. And uh, we had uh, as uh, uh, speakers uh, on that uh, series, uh, Professor John Schwartz from Caltech, Professor Ed Witten from the Institute of, Institute of Advanced Study, Princeton, uh, Professor Comron Vafa from Harvard, Professor Juan Maldesena, again from IAS Princeton, and Professor Abe Ashtekar from Penn State. Now, the theme of MOU uh, ILS-1 was primarily string theory, quantum gravity, and black holes. Now, October 19th is when I received an email from Professor T.V. Ramakrishnan, who is the uh, Department of Science and Technology Year of Science Chair Professor, as well as a distinguished associate in the Department of Physics, IAC Bangalore, uh, along and also an emeritus professor at Banaras Hindu University, Varanasi. And uh, essentially he wondered, and I quote, if possible, something on the mysteries of the universe as reflected in other fields of physics may also be considered. In fact, he was kind and gracious enough not only to suggest an incredible list of global luminaries in condensed matter physics, he volunteered to make what I call his first contact with, uh, uh, with, with them. And in fact, uh, do it on behalf of the Institute Lecture Series Committee of IIT Roorkee. And in fact, about half the speakers in the series is as a result of his efforts. I'm sure Professor Ramakrishnan would not have wanted me to say any of this, but I just had to get it off my chest. And we are so grateful for this, what I call a CMP HEP collaboration. So he's from Kenneth Matter Physics, I'm from High Energy Physics, so that's the reason for the, uh, the CMP HEP collaboration. Now, uh, the physics department, in fact, of IIT Roorkee has a rich history of having Kenneth Matter Physics as a major research area in the department. In fact, I'm reminded of the architect of the physics department. Uh, the late Professor Sri Krishna Joshi, and another stalwart in computational kinetic matter physics, Professor Sushil Olak. The reason I especially mention these names is because, unfortunately, we lost both of them last year. Um, now, uh, let me, as I said, try to introduce uh, Professor Sir Anthony James Leggett, or Tony Leggett, as he's popularly known amongst uh, uh, friends and the CMP community in particular, so Professor Leggett is a theoretical physicist and Professor Emeritus at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. He's globally renowned for his work on low temperature properties of glasses, high temperature superconductivity, both Einstein condensation and the formulation of quantum mechanics, especially in the context of quantum measurement problem. His pioneering work on superfluidity was recognized by the 2003 Nobel Prize in physics, along with Vitaly Lazarevich Ginsburg, 
and Alexei Alexovich Abrikasov. Professor Leggett is a member of the National Academy of Sciences, the American Philosophical Society, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the Russian Academy of Sciences as a foreign member. He is, he is a foreign fellow of the Indian National Science Academy. He's a fellow of the, of the Royal Society. He's a fellow of the American Physical Society, the American Institute of Physics, and a life fellow of the Institute of Physics. He was awarded the 2003 Nobel Prize, as I've already mentioned, in, uh, for his pioneering contribution in the theory of superconductors and superfluids with Ginsburg and Abrikasov. He was appointed Knight Commander of the Order of the British Empire, or KBE in short, in 2004, Queen's Birthday Honors for Service to Physics. He is a recipient of the 2002-2003 Wolf Foundation Prize for Research on Condensed, matter, condensed Forms of Matter, uh, uh, a prize which he shared with Bertrand Halperin. He was also honored with the Eugene Feinberg Memorial Medal in 1999. So uh, with these few words, maybe not so few, <laughs> I would very humbly request uh, Professor Tony Leggett to kindly give the talk. And folks, uh, what's gonna be done is as follows. Uh, I am gonna be uh, sharing my screen and uh, we have uh, Professor Leggett's talk and we'll help him go up and down the slides. And uh, uh, there would be after the end of the talk, a brief Q and A session. Remember it's pretty early for Professor Leggett back at Urbana-Champaign. And uh, so we'll, we'll, uh, we'll have to restrict the, the, the questions which I would very humbly ask all our, uh, all our enthusiastic participants to kindly type in the chat. And uh, we would try to put some of those questions across to Professor Leggett for his kind uh, comments. So with that, I would uh, quickly share my screen. Okay. I think, and, uh, can I, let's just try one more thing. Uh, can we go up and down? Uh, yes, yes. down, and I go um, back up. So we're all set, Professor Leggett. Uh, excuse me, Professor, one minute, please. Yeah. Uh, all the participants are requested to not switch on their videos. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, yes, sir, we are good to go. Uh, Professor Leggett? Oh, I think. Uh, is, is there a connectivity issue? Um, oh. Oops. Not a very happy thing. Uh, it seems that uh, Professor Leggett had, oh, was logged out. Uh, he, some connectivity issue at his end. Is that okay? Ah, uh, yeah. Okay, great, great. Yeah. Uh, but Professor Leggett, please start. Sorry. Uh, yeah, right. Uh, okay, well, uh, th thank you again for a kind introduction and good evening, everyone. Uh, if we look at the state of physics in the year 2021, then with the possible exception of cosmology, we see that it reflects rather well the state of affairs which the late philosopher and historian of science, Thomas Kuhn, called normal science. That is, it is a, a kind of science in which the sort of questions you're allowed to ask, the kinds of answer you're allowed to give to them, and the nature of the evidence which you're allowed to adduce in favor of those answers are all pretty much uh, cut and dry. That is, they're fairly well agreed in the relevant community. And therefore, you might think that uh, discussions of technical issues in physics among professional physicists would be unlikely to generate the kind of high passions and emotional involvement which we're used to seeing in debates, say, about politics or even the social sciences. And yet, there is one such uh, issue which generates such high and even almost violent passions. As I have uh, found when I was young and mischievous, 
I used to occasionally go to cocktail parties at physics uh, conferences and threw this issue like a hand grenade into a bunch of Uh, Professor Leggett, uh, okay. Professor Leggett, I, I'm sorry, uh, we lost you there for about five seconds. Yeah, um, I had a, a note saying my internet connection is unstable. I don't quite know what to do about that. Okay, so uh, should I should I, I should I interrupt you uh, to tell you that we lost you for so many seconds, or? Uh, uh, I suppose you better. Yes. Um, okay, I'll do that. So yeah. anyway, as I was saying, I uh, used to. Uh, lob this particular question or issue into groups of unsuspecting physicists and stand by back and watch the results. Um, so uh, what is the issue in question? Well, it turns out that in the middle and late 20s of the last century, the physics community, having failed totally to understand what seemed to be going on at the atomic level in terms of what uh, we would now call classical physics, came up with what is not so much a new theory, but a whole new way of looking at the world, the, the way we call quantum mechanics. Over its nearly 100 year history, quantum mechanics has really been spectacularly successful. It describes not uh, just um, all the things it was intended to describe at the level of single electrons and atoms and even below, but also increasingly the behavior of complex systems of many atoms and molecules. So that uh, increasingly, um, uh, most of chemistry and at least a fairly large part of biology, we believe, can now be explained in terms of quantum mechanics. And yet, despite the success, if you take the approach given by quantum mechanics seriously and try to apply it to the everyday world around us, what I will call the macroscopic world, you come up with some very bizarre, uh, very bizarre situations indeed. So the question is, is this a problem? And that's where people curiously diverge. Opinion of the late uh, Leon Rosenfeld, who on co commenting on a particular paper in this area, said that it had completely resolved all the problems, leaving no loophole for extravagant speculation. On the other hand, uh, some, including myself, share the uh, opinion of the um, uh, Professor Leggett, it's that uh... We've lost you, your audio connection, your video is frozen. Hmm. Oh. Um, uh, okay, can we get yeah. the next slide please? Yep. Yes, we actually lost you for about uh, 10, 15 seconds there. Uh, well, okay, there's nothing important, I guess. Okay, all right, so go to the next slide. Yeah, okay, Here fine. Okay, so let us consider a very general thought experiment. Uh, many of you will recognize uh, one possible version of this as a typical young slits experiment uh, done with microscopic objects. Um, let's say, uh, well, we could say electrons or neutrons. Uh, let's say for definiteness, atoms. So 
in this very general experiment, we had a set of atoms which start off from some uh, initial state labeled A in the diagram, and then they can proceed to some final state E where they're inspected directly with uh, the naked eye. And they can get to from A to E by either of two paths, uh, B or C. As I say, uh, this could be a young slits experiment, in which case the uh, two paths, B and C, would correspond to the two slits in a screen. But equally well, this could be in some kind of abstract space. For example, the uh, states B and C could be the internal strangeness, uh, dis different strangeness states of the neutral K meson. It doesn't really matter. It's a very a generic experiment. But in any case, we um, arrange that we can allow ourselves either to inspect the state, uh, sorry, inspect whether a given uh, atom came through path B uh, or not uh, by opening the shutter at the top of the screen, or alternatively, by closing the shutter, we can uh, refuse to inspect whether a given atom came that way, that way or not. Similarly with path C. So uh, the, here, here's how the experiment goes. Let's suppose first that we shut off path C. We assume that our experimental colleagues know how to do this. For example, um, if, if we're really talking about a literal young slits experiment, we would simply put some opaque material in the slit C. In any case, they know how to block it. So we shut off C and measure the probability that we go from A via B to, to E. And let's call that piece of B. Uh, next, we do the opposite. We shut off path B and thereby measure the probability of going uh, from A through C to E and label that a piece of C. Finally, we open both paths and measure the probability that we start from A and go through, well, at least we you know, tend to say either path B or path C to the final state E. And let's call that P sub B or C. Uh, next slide, please. So what is the result of this experiment? Well, first of all, suppose that we decide to look to see whether it's path B or path C, uh, which is followed. Then we find, first of all, that indeed, each individual atom does indeed follow either path B or path C. And secondly, that P sub B or C, that is the probability of going from A to E with both paths open, is simply the sum of the probabilities of going through path B plus those of going through path C. And that really isn't terribly surprising. Um, suppose, for example, that um, we have a set of passengers who are traveling from uh, Chicago to, let's say, to Delhi. And let's suppose they can go either via Atlanta or via Frankfurt. Then the total number. Uh, Professor Leggett, we lost you again. Mm. Uh, can you hear me, Professor Leggett? Uh, Professor Leggett, can you hear me? Okay. Uh, uh, yeah, actually, the, you know, we, you, when you started off with your example from uh, Chicago to, to Delhi via two options, post that, we lost you. Okay. So, uh, so uh, what we could suggest is maybe you could turn off your video uh, so that that would uh, eat less into, into the bandwidth and maybe it'll help you uh, to stabilize. So if you switch off your video okay, and just on. have the audio on. Um, yeah, okay. Uh, let's see. Uh, how's that? 
Yeah. All right. So we don't see you, but we hear you. Oh. So. Oh, okay. Well, that should be enough. Okay. Okay. Well, fast. Fine. I was just making the remark that um, yeah. obviously, if you have um, a set of passengers who are tra traveling from Chicago to Delhi, and they can come either via Atlanta or via Frankfurt, then the total number of particles, uh, sorry, total number of people arriving in Chicago, in Delhi from Chicago, is simply the sum of those who came through Atlanta and those who came through Frankfurt. Uh, nothing at all extraordinary about that. On the other hand, suppose we don't look, we decide not to look to inspect whether a given atom went through path B or path C. In that case, what we find is that the probability of arrival when both paths are open is in general not simply the sum of the probability of arrival through each channel separately. In fact, we can have P sub B non-zero, P sub C non-zero, but the total probability when both paths are open a zero is zero. That's the phenomenon which technically is called total destructive interference. So what this seems to suggest is that at least when we The next slide, please. Yeah, we again lost you for the last five or 10 seconds. Oh, I don't <laughs> Okay. Uh, anyways, uh, would you want to say, would you like to repeat something that you said in the last few seconds, or should we go to the next slide? Uh, well, just to see the couple of lines at the bottom of the slide. N neither. Uh, what, what, what this uh, intuitively suggests is that when uh, we uh, don't inspect which path is followed, then and it is not true that each individual atom selects either path B or path C. Okay, so let's go on to the next slide. Okay, well, then that's, that's a very experimental fact. But let's now just briefly discuss the account given by quantum mechanics. And here, in the next few slides, I'm just going to ask you uh, to do a very small amount of elementary algebra. I hope that uh, will be okay. But don't, in any case, don't worry if you can't follow the speed. It's the conclusions which are important. Anyway, so here is the uh, account given by quantum mechanics. Each possible process is represented not by a probability, but by something called a probability amplitude, A. And that probability amplitude has the property that can be either positive or negative. Uh, some of you may know that's a bit of an oversimplification, but for our purposes, it will do. So it can be either positive or negative. And the total amplitude to go from A to E is the sum of the amplitudes to go by different possible paths. That is, in this case, A goes to B goes to E, and A goes to C goes to E. So that's the total amplitude. But the probability to go from A to E is the square of the total amplitude. Okay, next slide, please. Yeah, so let's see how that works out. Uh, first of all, if path C is shut off, then the total amplitude is simply that to go through path B, that's A sub B, and the probability, which by definition is, we've, we've called P sub B, is simply A sub B squared. Similarly, if path B is shut off, then the total amplitude is only A sub C. That means that the probability, which we, under these circumstances we call P sub C, is just A sub C squared. However, if both paths are open, then the total amplitude is actually the sum of the amplitudes to go through path B and to go through path C. And that is what is called technically a quantum superposition of those two amplitudes. And now the probability, which remember is the square of the total amplitude, uh, the probability uh, B sub B or C is the square of the total amplitude, AB plus A sub C squared, and just multiplying that out, that gives us AB squared plus AC squared plus twice AB times AC. But now you remember that A sub B squared is just what we earlier called P sub B, a sub C squared is what we previously called P sub C. 
And therefore, the probability to go th through path B or path C, uh, uh, sorry, the probability when both paths are open, which we've called P sub B or C, that is, it's indeed the sum of P sub B and P sub C, but uh, the, co the common sense result, but plus this crucial so-called interference term. And uh, you notice that in order for this interference term to be non-zero, so that we don't get simply the classical result, uh, the common sense result, uh, A sub B and A sub C must simultaneously exist for the atom in question. And let me emphasize for the atom in question, not just for the whole set of atoms, but for each atom separately. So whatever that means, we, we just note that both A sub B and A sub C uh, must be non-zero uh, to get the, uh, the, uh, the not, not common sense result. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, uh, just one more technical thing and then we can finish with the algebra. So just uh, um, repeating this from the last slide, P sub B or C, the probability of arrival when both paths are open, is the common sense result P sub B plus P sub C plus this crucial last interference term. But now suppose that A sub C is plus or minus A sub B at random, just different for each, each atom. Then the average over the ensemble of atoms of P sub B or C is, well, uh, it's the common sense result plus the average of twice A sub B, A sub C, But the average of A sub B, A sub That's a common sense result. So that's... Oh, sorry, uh, Professor Leggett, we again lost you for about five seconds there. No, um, this is getting really rather tedious. Um, yeah. the, um, I, I'm afraid probably the fault is my end because I am getting these notices about uh, my internet connection being unstable. So. Uh, yeah, well, um, so maybe uh, if, you, if you feel like you could uh, do a quick repeat of the last yeah. uh, couple of uh, I don't know, statements, if possible, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, okay. So the, the, uh, okay, the, the important uh, conclusion is not uh, not for the moment the last statement on slide uh, six, but the next to last. Um, if if the a sub c, is if the amplitude goes down path c is plus or minus a sub b, the amplitude for path b, at random for the different atoms of the ensemble, then we simply get the common sense result, and that in turn is as if each system uh, chose both path B and path C. Uh, sorry, I'm sorry. So it's as if each system chose either path B or path C, okay? Now, what all this, but when we put all this together, um, the experiments and the quantum mechanical description of the experiments, what this seems to suggest rather strongly is that when A sub B and A sub C simultaneously exist, that is, they're both not zero, then it is not true that each individual atom selected either path B or path C. Okay, that's the important conclusion. If, if in the quantum mechanical description, both A sub B and A sub C are non-zero, then it is not true that each individual system, uh, in this case, each individual atom, selected um, either one path or the other. Now, the positive statements that you might want to make are some, some extent a matter of taste. That um, each individual atom selects both path B and path C, or perhaps neither path B nor path C. Or perhaps you might want to say that the question is not meaningful. But the one thing you cannot say is that each individual atom selected either path B or path C. Okay, that's the important conclusion of these few slides I've just been going through. Next slide, please. 
Okay, well, um, there's a bit of sociology here, which I can admit, um, but um, the, uh, uh, the person who convinced much of the physics community that um, uh, th there's really no problem here was uh, Niels Bohr. And basically to just uh, try to condense uh, Bohr's uh, approach into a single sentence, he basically um, claimed that this is not in any sense uh, odd because microscopic objects are really not at all like um, everyday level objects and therefore it is not particularly odd that they should behave in a totally different way. That's a, a gross oversimplification of Niels Bohr's point of view, but uh, crudely speaking, that was it, and that convinced a large number of people. However, there are always um, uh, counter-suggestible people around, and one of them was uh, one of the founders of quantum mechanics, uh, Owen Schrodinger, on the left. And he, um, in 1935, he came up with a famous thought experiment to refute uh, Niels Bohr's um, explanation. So uh, next slide, please. Okay, so this is the thought, uh, this is just a, a small variant of the uh, thought experiment which uh, Schrodinger devised. He imagines that we have a set of, um, uh, of microscopic objects, let's say atoms, which start off in, in, in state A, and from there can either go down path B or down path C. Now, if, let us say the first, let's just consider the first atom out of the gate. Talking classically, if the first atom out of the gate goes down path B, then it just goes away harmlessly and nothing in particular happens. And in particular, a cat inside a closed box here, um, nothing happens to it, it just remains um, alive and uh, mewing happily. If on the other hand, that first atom goes down path C, then uh, it uh, enters some kind of counter, it triggers some electronics, and as a result of that, a hammer falls on a closed vial of cyanide inside the box. The vial is shattered, the um, cyanide is released, and the cat um, uh, dies. Um, and you'll notice, incidentally, that this is uh, historically accurate. There was an unfortunate misconception in some quarters that Schrodinger's cat is uh, either shot or acted, but uh, no, in the actual paper, he's, she is poisoned. And here's the poison to show. Well, what's the point of what um, uh, uh, Schrodinger calls this hellish device? Well, it's a very general principle of quantum mechanics. And if state, initial state one evolves into final state one prime, and initial state two evolves into final state two prime, then quite inexorably, the superposition of states one and two evolves into the superposition of states one prime and two prime. So what happens if the, uh, the atoms uh, which come through this apparatus are actually described by a quantum superposition of um, uh, uh, B and so path B and path C. Well, path B led to the cat ending up alive, path C led to en her ending up dead, and therefore the superposition of, of uh, states B and C must lead inexorably to a superposition of states of the universe in one of which the cat is alive and in the other of which she is dead. In other words, the um, at the end of the day, the quantum mechanical amplitude for the cat to be alive must be non-zero. Uh, the amplitude for her to be dead must be simultaneously non-zero. Um, and yet, Seem to have lost you again, Professor Leggett.
Um, team, do we see Professor Leggett still logged in? No, sir. Oh. I, I, sorry, it seems Professor Leggett's connection is really unstable. Um, uh, he's back. He's back, okay. Uh, Professor Leggett, uh, are you, yeah. are you, are you yeah. uh, okay? All right, so yeah. We, yeah, we lost you for about 15 seconds. Okay, well, um, anyway, the conclusion of um, this, um, uh, of this argument um, is that at the end of the day, um, after the first atom has gone through the apparatus and had time to activate it, then the amplitude for the cat to be alive is non-zero and the amplitude for her to be dead is non-zero. Now, here's the, uh, uh, the point. Um, in the case of the atom, if we had this situation where both these amplitudes are non-zero, then we were not allowed, the one thing we could not say is that each individual system did one thing or the other. So if we're going to be consistent, we should say that in the Schrodinger's cat thought experiment, at the end of the day, it is not the case that each individual cat is either definitely alive or definitely dead. Now, um, the animal protection societies have indeed So and it's not clear whether this state of affairs is more uncomfortable for the cat or for the theoretical physicist who has to contemplate it. Anyway, that is the famous or infamous Schrodinger's cat paradox. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so the cat paradox has now been around for 85 years and um, there must be thousands, probably tens of thousands of papers in the, not just the physics literature, but also the philosophy literature, which have claimed to resolve the paradox. And crudely speaking, these uh, resolutions fall into two classes. The first class assumes that quantum mechanics is a universal description of at least the physical world. So that it in principle describes counters and cats and so on, just as well as it describes um, atoms and electrons. And now if one makes that assumption, there are various possible um, resolutions. I'll take these slightly out of order. Let me take first the extreme statistical interpretation of quantum mechanics. Um, what that interpretation says is, crudely speaking, that you know, you're really taking all this far too seriously. All that the formalism of quantum mechanics um, is and was ever meant to be is simply a recipe. That is, it's a set of symbols and rights on a piece of paper to enable us to start from a given uh, the description of a given experimental uh, um, initial state and to work out the probabilities of various um, outcomes, various experimental outcomes at the end of the day. In other words, when the, uh, our description of the final state of Schrodinger's cat is by this curious quantum superposition, all that actually means is that the probability of her finding her to be alive is non-zero and the probability of her finding, finding her to be dead is non-zero. And beyond that, you simply should not interpret the, uh, the formalism in as referring to anything whatever in the real world. It is just a recipe, quite literally. It's like the recipes, for example, which the ancient Chaldeans are said to have used to calculate eclipses, which we now know corresponded to nothing whatever in the real world. Well, that resolution of the paradox 
does have the virtue of being internally consistent. I mean, after all, if something is simply a recipe, how could it be internally inconsistent? Well, the only way would be if different prescriptions for applying the recipe to a given experimental situation should turn out to give contra mutually contradictory results. And I think everyone, including me, agrees that with quantum mechanics, that is not the case. So it is consistent. It's very, very uncomfortable. And I find that it's um, even more uncomfortable to most experimental physicists than it is um, to a theorist like me. Um, because basically, um, the, if you really take that interpretation seriously, then the question, what was the state of this particular cat in this particular box before I took the lid off the box and inspected her? That question uh, not only has no answer, it's essentially meaningless. I think that really that, uh, is, that point of view is extremely uncongenial to most practicing physicists. Okay, well, so um, if we don't like the extreme statistical interpretation, let's go to the other extreme and take a look at what is uh, sometimes called the many worlds or relative state or Everett Wheeler interpretation. And that um, interpretation actually goes to the opposite extreme. It says, look, yes, take the formalism of quantum mechanics deadly seriously, not just at the level of the electron and the atom, but equally at the level of the cat. So, so it is indeed true that the cat is, until inspected, is neither in one state, neither alive nor dead, but in this curious quantum superposition. Well, then you say, okay, but I've just taken the lid off this particular box and this particular cat looks to me to be alive and well, mewing happily. What happened to the piece of the amplitude which corresponded to her being dead? And then at this point, the advocates of the many worlds interpretation uh, look you in the eye and say to you solemnly, well, what you have to realize is that there was actually a parallel universe which is equally real to the world you think you're inhabiting, in which not only is this particular cat dead, but you um, believe she is dead and all your colleagues believe she is dead. And then there are all sorts of formal theorems which are actually proved in Hugh Everett's original thesis, uh, which tell you that there is no, in some sense, no possibility of um, cross contact between these different so-called uh, alternative universes. Well, I wish I could say something intelligent about the many worlds interpretation, but I'm afraid I can't. And the reason is that I quite literally do not understand it. When, it, when the advocates of the, that interpretation say that these alternative universes, which I don't, I'm not conscious of, and could never be conscious of, when they say that these are, quote, equally real, unquote, those words sound like English. What do they actually mean? I claim that they are simply totally meaningless, and the many worlds so-called interpretation is just, just a verbal window dressing with no, no, no substance behind it, whatever. So finally, if I don't like either the extreme statistical or the many worlds interpretation, what can I fall back on? Well, there is the so-called, what I call the orthodox resolution. I call it that because I think this is the kind of interpretation that many uh, practicing physicists, if they think seriously about the problem, uh, come to more or less spontaneously, as a result of which it's been published probably thousands of times um, over and over in the literature. Um, how does it go? Well, let's recall that in general, P sub B or C, probability of going from A to E with both paths open, is not simply the common sense result, the first two terms here, P sub B plus P sub C, but it also contains the so-called interference term, which involves both amplitudes, A sub B and A sub C. However, we also saw in an earlier slide that if A sub C is plus or minus A sub B at random, 
is the average over the ensemble for P sub B um, or C um, is, well, it's P sub B plus P sub C plus the average of uh, twice A sub B A sub C, but that then averages to zero. And so we just get the common sense result. Now, now generally speaking, the effect of the uh, outside world um, on a quantum mechanical system is to randomize the sign of A sub B relative to A sub C. And this effect gets more effective as the system gets larger, more complex, and so on and so forth. And therefore, in the absence at least of very special precautions, which we'll uh, come back to, uh, for everyday objects such as cats, the interference term uh, just vanishes. That's the phenomenon which technically is called decoherence. Um, and uh, so, uh, uh, so in fact, we conclude that um, in the Schrodinger's cat uh, experiment, uh, the interference term vanishes and the um, uh, probability um, of finding her alive or dead is just the sum of probabilities, finding her alive and finding her dead. Uh, so far, so good. And I have no argument, no uh, objection to the argument up to that point. But then the advocates of this interpretation go on to argue, well, since the experimental predictions are now exactly the same as if each system had chosen either B or C, then we might as well say that each system did choose either B or C. Each individual cat was either definitely alive or definitely indeed before I inspected her. And it seems to me that last uh, step in the argument is a gross logical non sequitur. Um, and it, it confuses the question of the possible or impossible interpretations of the quantum formalism with the evidence that that interpretation is possible or inter impossible. At the microscopic level, we concluded that we could not say that each atom uh, chose definitely path B or path C. Uh, that was the uh, statement about the possible or impossible interpretations of the formalism. The evidence for that was the phenomenon of interference. By the time we get up to the macroscopic level, then the interference, um, the experimental evidence for interference has gone away. Does that mean that we can suddenly uh, drastically reinterpret the meaning of the formulas? I claim no. It's as if we had a murder trial. The, let us say the accused is uh, supposed is uh, accused of killing his wife, and there is a vital piece of evidence, say, a bloody axe with her blood all over it and her fingerprints all over it, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And the everyone says, well, for sure he's guilty. You now imagine that in the middle of the trial, that vital piece of evidence suddenly disappears. Does that mean that the accused has suddenly become innocent? I don't think so. Similarly, I don't believe that simply because the evidence against a particular interpretation of the quantum formalism has gone away, you are free to suddenly go, uh, go out and choose that, that interpretation. So my own personal conclusion would be that none of these three um, alleged resolutions, assuming that quantum mechanics is universal, um, are really viable. So uh, next slide, please. Well, uh, that goes on. Uh, let's um, uh, make the alternative um, uh, assumption. Let's suppose that quantum mechanics somehow breaks down at some point en route from the atom to the cat. Uh, in such a way that each cat uh, can indeed uh, become, uh, become definitely alive or dead by the end of the experiment. But will you say, okay, well, it's a nice uh, sort of qualitative idea. Are there any quantitative implementations of it? And the answer is yes, there are actually several, of which the best known is the so-called GRWP, that's Girardi Rimini Weber Pool theory. I won't go into the details of this um, because uh, for reasons of time. But um, uh, crudely speaking, it does have that uh, effect. It ensures that at the microscopic level, quantum mechanics works fine. But by the time you get to the macroscopic level, 
definite outcomes are realized. And well, as I say, there are other uh, alternative uh, theories. I won't stick, plant my flag on any particular theory, but I'll consider the general class of theories, which I will call macro realistic, which have, simply have the property that by the time you get to the macroscopic or everyday level, definite events occur, as it were. Things do one thing or the other. Um, and and uh, then I'll, I'll ask, well, um, can we uh, test this idea? Okay, next slide, please. So, so that raises the question, is quantum mechanics the whole truth or does some alternative uh, macro realistic theory take over at some point as we go from the level of the atom to that of the cat? Well, could we tell? Now, Oh, yeah, here we get a very important point that the interference term is automatically randomized. That is, if they all suffer from um, uh, decoherence, then we'll always get the common sense result. That is, all experimental results will be as if one path or the other were followed. Quantum mechanics will just make the same predictions as a macro realistic theory. Uh, in other words, you can't tell. So it follows that what we have to do. Two states in question is at the everyday level, otherwise there's no point in doing the experiment. Nevertheless, it turns out the relevant energies have to be at the atomic level. You might think that those two are mutually contradictory, but turns out not so, as we'll see. Um, we have an extreme, we have an extreme degree of isolation in the outside world, so as to avoid uh, decoherence by the environment. And finally, we should have very low intrinsic dissipation because it turns out that um, the uh, that intrinsic dissipation has basically the same effect as uh, the uh, effect of the environment. It gives rise to a strong degree of decoherence. Now, um, what we ha uh, having found such a system, what we'd like to do is to first of all. Uh, work out what you would expect on a macro realistic future, and secondly, what you'd expect if quantum mechanics is in fact the whole truth up to that level. But now we have a problem. The systems we're going to be talking about are not well characterized uh, microscopic systems like single uh, elementary particles or even single atoms. They're large. Uh, complicated, messy objects sitting on their benches and so forth. And therefore, um, it really doesn't make a lot of sense to try to give a complete a priori quantum mechanical description of them. So you might think that we can, there's no way of getting off the ground in that case. It turns out there is an alternative um, approach. Um, namely, what we can do is not to say, not to work out an exact a priori macroscopic, microscopic description, but rather start from the experimental behavior of the system in the classical limit, where uh, ordinary classical physics and quantum mechanics get the same result, and to work out from there enough, not a total microscopic description, but enough of such a description so that we can then go on with confidence to do the quantum mechanics calculations. And that is the procedure which has been followed over the last um, 40 years or so for dealing uh, with this um, problem. And I think that most of the theorists who've engaged in this exercise uh, would agree that it is at least prima facie reasonably reliable. So at least at first sight, we do have a, uh, some fairly confident quantum mechanical uh, predictions. Um, okay, next slide, please. 
Yeah. OK, so let me just um, uh, uh, go on to describe one of these uh, systems in question. Uh, there are, as I say, in fact, there is more than one. There are several types of system, and by now, experiments are being done on all of them. But here is a particular system I've been myself particularly interested in. Um, this is a, a what used to be called a um, an RF uh, squid superconducting quantum interference device. Nowadays, it's usually called a flux qubit, uh, and this is uh, this is a um, a um, a picture courtesy of my experimental uh, colleague at Illinois, Delbert Harling. So the actual, uh, here are the dimensions, 0.5 millimeters across here you see. The active element is actually just this little bit in here, which is blown up down here. So you see it's probably just about detectable physically with the naked eye. But that's not the important point. The important point is that we're going to be talking about two uh, states of this little bit of metal which are macroscopically distinct. And now um, let me make a, a small digression to um, talk a little about the physics behind uh, the experiments in question. So next slide, please. OK, so here's a small digression for the next three or four um, uh, slides on the physics of superconductivity. Um, elementary particles come in two types. Um, uh, um, depending on whether they have integral or half integral spin uh, in units of Dirac's constant, Planck's constant divided by 2 pi h bar. Um, if the uh, spin is um, 0, 1, or 2, they're called bosons. If they, it's uh, half, 3 halves, 5 halves, they're called fermions. And these two types of particle behave in radically different ways. Fermions are really pretty boring. At low temperature, they um, are extremely xenophobic. Um, they uh, will not tolerate having one more than one particle per state. And therefore, at low temperatures, they simply fill the so-called Fermi C of, of uh, states. They occupy the uh, energy levels up to a, a given energy, the so-called Fermi energy. And uh, after that, the distribution drops off to zero. So that's pretty boring. Um, bosons are somewhat more interesting um, because uh, they are very gregarious. They love having um, lots of particles in the same state. In fact, they love it so much that at sufficiently low temperatures and high densities, you'll find that a non-zero fraction of the whole, whole, whole uh, set of I'm sorry, Professor Leggett, it's that uh, connectivity issue again. We seem to have lost you. Your video is frozen. Yes, I'm, mu I'm muted, right? Uh, okay. Sorry, Professor Leggett, we lost you after when you were talking about the gregarious nature of bosons. Okay, Post okay. that, we lost you. So. Okay, well, well, this is rather important, so yeah, go back to that. Yeah. Um, okay, so they, they are so precarious that at low temperatures, especially low temperatures, and Identities um, neons has interval spin. Zero, one, Sorry, two. Professor Leggett, uh, I apologize. It seems that uh, the connection seems to be fermionic rather than bosonic in nature. It doesn't like uh, repetitions. So, uh, this time, when you're repeating it, it's getting uh, blocked. We don't hear you. Uh, can we give it one last shot for this slide? I would really be grateful. Just one last yeah. repeat. So, um, a, a compound object 
consisting of an even number of fermions is a boson and therefore can undergo the Can't hear anything. Can you hear me? Uh, it seems this part of the slide is jinxed. Anytime yeah. you say it, repeat it, it, it you get uh, we stop here. Well, why don't we? Why don't we go on to the next slide and yeah. I'll just uh, repeat there. Yeah. Okay, great, very good. Let me do that. Okay, so the bit which got left off the last slide is that an, a, an object containing an, in, a, an even number of fermions acts like a boson and therefore can undergo Bose condensation. Okay. So you might think that what's going on in a superconductor is that um, electrons get together in pairs in, and to form a sort of dielectronic molecule like so, and then undergo Bose condensation. But that's actually not right, or at least it was not thought to be right reg um, as regards the old fashioned superconductors. Possibly it may have some truth as regards the so called high temperature ones. What happens in the old fashioned superconductors, at least, is that the electrons indeed get together to form pairs, but those pairs have a very large uh, radius um, compared to the average distance between electrons. So that uh, you have electron one forming a Cooper pair with electron two, but they're very far apart. And between them, there are any number of other electrons forming their own Cooper pairs. So it's sometimes, it's sometimes compared to a form of mod modern dance in which my um, movements are well correlated with those of my partner, but she is way across the room. And between us, there are any number of other couples forming their own uh, pairs. It's a very collective kind of phenomenon. In any case, having formed Cooper, Cooper pairs, uh, once you form Cooper pairs, then at least in the simplest so-called BCS theory, these pairs must automatically undergo Bose condensation. That is, they must all do exactly the same thing at the same time. That's true both for equilibrium and even non-equilibrium situations. Okay, did, did all that come through? Absolutely, yes. Did you get? Yes. Yeah, okay, fine. So we can, good, that's important. So, so now let's go on to the next slide. We are on the next slide. Mm. Maybe Professor Leggett, if you're hearing me, you could once again turn off your video. Maybe that improves the situation at your end. I don't know if that got through. Okay. So uh, as a preliminary to discussing the, the actual Unfortunately, Professor Leggett has an unstable internet connection. Team, is he still there? Uh, yes, uh, he's in the meeting. Okay. Um, ah. my, my, now, my audio is unmuted. Do you want it that way? It is, uh, yeah, it is unmuted, good. So we hear you now. Okay. Um, let's try the um, the, uh, So this is a, a, a intermediate step on the way to the actual experimental uh, system. Superconducting ring in external magnetic flux. It turns out that there was a quantization condition for a particle charge 2E, uh, that is a Cooper pair, pair of electrons, 
namely that the circulation, the integral of v dot dl around the ring, uh, is given by h over 2m times n, an integer, minus the flux through the ring in units of the flux quantum h over 2. Why is that interesting? Well, um, if, if the flux through the ring is zero, then the uh, ground state uh, has to correspond to n equals, uh, sorry, the energy, important, the energy is proportional to k squared. So if the flux is zero, the ground state cor simply corresponds to n equals zero, all the pairs at rest, nothing interesting happens. However, what happens if the flux is exactly half a flux quantum, h over 2 e? Then the ground state is what we call doubly degenerate. That is, there are two possible values of n, n equals 0 or n equals 1. They both give the same value of k squared in this case. So that means that there are two possible ground states. In one of them, all the pairs are rotating clockwise. In the other, all of them are rotating anticlockwise. Now you might ask, well, can't we sometimes um, mix these together so we have a state with 50% rotating clockwise and 50% anticlockwise? And the answer is no, we can't. That is strongly forbidden by energy considerations. Uh, the system has got to do either one thing or the other. OK, let's go on. Next slide. OK, now this is in some sense the, uh, at least close to the real experimental system. We've simply uh, printed this up by putting um, in our bulk superconducting ring a uh, Josephson uh, junction. Um, and if you are not familiar with Josephson junctions, think of them as just gates, which can allow Cooper pairs to pass through, but with increased difficulty. And then it turns out that this has an interesting effect. It turns out that the uh, ground state is now a quantum superposition of states in which all of the a state in which all of the electrons are rotating clockwise and a second state in which they're all rotating anticlockwise. Again, I emphasize, this is not the same as saying that half the electrons are doing one thing and half the other. The system is in a quantum superposition. Uh, if you had one of the states or the other, then your energy, whereas if you had the quantum superposition, you get the characteristic level repulsion effect, and they would, uh, the lines would be the green lines. Uh, so that, that evidence was already found way back in um, 2000. Um, uh, Since then, uh, there have been many striking. Um, had you asked me in 1999 to predict how many coherent oscillations of this system you could see before the oscillation was damped out, I'd be certainly lucky to see two or three. Nowadays, in fact, this, um, this uh, viewpoint is out of date. Nowadays, you can see of the order of 10 to the 4 such oscillations in these systems. So it's, really very, very good evidence that these occur. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, we are slide. on the next slide. We are on the next slide. I'm, I'm not seeing the next slide. Well, is this the one which says other systems where quantum mechanics have been tested oh. in directions of... Yeah, actually, you can, you, you can skip that one. Let's go on to um, uh, slide 18. We are on slide 18 now. I'm still seeing slide 16. Uh, there's probably a lag. Maybe if you give it a few seconds, it's 18 oh. on my laptop. Okay. Can someone confirm in the team that are we, is slide 18 visible or is it still slide 16? Because it's showing 18 on my laptop. Uh, so we are on 18. Yeah, so Professor Leggett, I think there is just a lag on your, at your end. Uh, 
we we are seeing slide 18 tests of macro okay. realism versus quantum mechanics yeah. using squid yeah yeah that, that's what i'd like yeah. if we could ask people to see that i, I, I mean, basically remember what's on it but uh... Well, still not seeing it. So oh. um, well, one option is I stop sharing and I start sharing again. I don't know if that's going to work. Okay. Should we do that? Yeah. Okay, great. Let me do that. All right. Can you see that? Can you see no. this slide 18 now? No, what I can see is a, bl a black screen uh, with your name uh, in the middle of it. Oh, good Lord, this is worse than what it was earlier. Uh, saying Alok Mishra has, has started screen sharing. Yeah, the problem is Alok Mishra has already shared his screen <laughs> um, a while back. Um, hmm. So well, okay. Yeah. Maybe give it one more shot. I'm going to stop sharing. I'm going to close the file. I'm going to open the file again and then start sharing again. Yeah, okay. Okay. Let's do that. Okay, I I did what I said. So we are again on slide 18. Do you see slide 18, Professor Leggett? Um, okay, so... So we are actually in slide 18. There are two more slides to go. Ah, uh, yeah. Uh, Professor Leggett, uh, I did what I said and I'm on slide number 18 again. Do you see slide 18 now? Oh. Yes, okay. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, I can. So do you see okay. slide 18 on your screen now? Yes, yes, I do. Yes, okay. Thank God for that. Yeah. Okay, great. <laughs> okay, so um, way back in 1995, in fact, Anupam Gurg and I um, made the following proposal that you could actually use a squid, or as we now say, a flux qubit, um, to test macrorealism against quantum mechanics. How does that work? Well, the argument is actually formally almost identical to the, uh, an argument you may be familiar with in a different context, that of so-called EPR Bell experiments. Um, for a squid or flux qubit, let's define the class of macrorealistic theories by three postulates. First of all, whether or not you're actually observing the state, it's always definitely in one state or the other, with the exclusion of very sh short intervals where it's making a transition, which we can allow for. Um, that's postulate number one. Um, postulate number two is that in principle, we can determine whether the state is the plus or minus one without any effect on the subsequent behavior. Uh, that's what we call non-invasive measurability. And postulate number three is induction, which is a bad name. It really means the basic but the basic idea of the arrow of time, that the initial conditions can cause final ones, but not vice versa. Then it turns out there's a certain quantity k whose value can be directly inferred from an appropriate series of measurements, and we can make the following predictions for k. First of all, any macrorealistic theory uh, will predict that k is less than or equal to 2. And I don't think there's too much argument about that. I think the argument there is pretty firm. Um, quantum mechanics, the ideal case, that is a perfectly isolated system with ideal measurements, etc., etc., uh, predicts that k is 2.8. Uh, 
uh, which is clearly not less than or equal to two. And I think again, that's um, uh, that's pretty well agreed. Uh, more slightly um, less um, uh, less hundred percent firmer firm. Um, quantum mechanics with all the real life complications predicts that k is greater than two, but less than still less than two point eight. So we still get a contradiction with macro realism. So therefore, to the extent that uh, the analysis of C within quantum mechanics is reliable, we can actually do an experiment to force nature to choose between macro realism and quantum mechanics. Well, as I say, we made that proposal way back in, um, uh, in 1985, um, and, uh, but it was not, uh, for various technical reasons, uh, it wasn't possible to do it for quite some time, but um, but in fact, uh, four years ago, not precisely this experiment, but a very closely related one was done. Can we the next slide, please? This uh, slide right here. Yep. Uh, okay. So um, okay. Well, we've essentially covered this, this slide. So let's go on to twenty. Okay. So as I say, it wasn't exactly this experiment, but it was a closely related one, which was done in November 2016 by a group at ATT in Japan. I am a co-author, though I, my contribution was minor to that. But the um, effectively, the result was B. Um, that, that is, that a macro Realism fails by up to 80 standard deviations. Way towards our uh, everyday world and uh, actually um, arguably more than that. Where do we go from here? Well, I, it's probably possible to go simply in the direction of larger devices, um, et cetera, et cetera, but I don't think that's particularly interesting. Much more interesting is to see if we can actually test quantum mechanics at the level of greater complexity. Uh, one uh, possible idea would be to test if the human visual system uh, can actually be put into a superposition or a quantum superpositions of states. And a few years ago, um, uh, a couple of my colleagues here at uh, the University of Illinois did in fact start to try to do an experiment on the human eye uh, to test this. Unfortunately, it turned out that um, the human eye is a very, very inefficient detector. And to take enough data to be meaningful would take much more than the lifetime of the graduate student involved. So we uh, that, that uh, was not, not immediately successful. Nevertheless, I personally believe that it is of crucial importance to go on pressing the predictions of quantum mechanics closer and closer to our everyday experience. And uh, my personal guess, uh, it's only a guess, is that um, at some point between the level of the, the atom and the level of our direct experience, we are going to find some kind of breakdown. We don't know where quantum mechanics is going to break down. We don't know how it's going to break down. But that it's going to break down, I think we can be pretty certain. So that would be my personal conclusion. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor Leggett. Uh, thanks a lot. Thank you so much. I'm going to stop sharing the screen uh, with your permission. Yes, yes, please. Go ahead. Okay, so um, fine. So I think uh, let's uh, have a round of applause uh, for Professor Leggett's uh, 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 talk. Maybe we can all unmute ourselves. Um, Okay, um, so.
So let me see. Now we move on to the uh, the QA session. And um, uh, team, can you please uh, please uh, unmute Professor Leggett? Uh, I just muted everybody. Can somebody please unmute Professor Leggett. I'm now unmuted. Uh, okay, perfect, perfect. Okay, great. So uh, let's see. Um, where do I find the chats? Okay. Um, so is it okay if we have like a few questions? Sure. Just like about three or so. Sure, okay, sure. so let's see. Um, just a moment. There is a stream of questions. Uh, let me just uh, see. I think I better use my phone. It's uh, easier for me because I've already identified some queries. Uh, just a moment, please. Okay, so okay, so there are, there are a couple of queries from Surajit Sen, uh, and uh, he, uh, so the query number one is, does the sum over histories as often defined in Feynman path integral formalism have any role in the Young's double slit experiment? Uh, well, yes, I think it's a very direct uh, application. Um, however, of course, there are, um, there are a number of technical issues uh, connected with the, um, the literal young slits experiment. Um, in particular, the usual assumption uh, which is made in discussing the young slits experiment is that by blocking or opening one slit, one doesn't affect the nature of the propagation through the other slit. And that is, in fact, not entirely obvious, and in, in fact, not, not even entirely true uh, if you really look into it very hard. But, um, but that consideration doesn't, in fact, affect the main conclusions drawn from the young slits experiment. So, yeah, you know, the, uh, in some sense, the, you, would, you would say that the young slits experiment is the most uh, immediate and direct application of the Feynman path integral. Very good. Uh, so there is a second question from the same uh, person. And the question is uh, the following. Uh, he says, many textbooks mention that watch, quote unquote, watching or spying of electrons in any of the slits or route destroys the interference patterns due to destruction of the conditions of coherence. So your argument uh, here shows that the quantum kick by the watchman of the spy does not have any role in Young's double slit. So, uh, According to this person, he says that this establishes the entanglement at the preeminent position rather than the watchman of the spy argument. So you're requested to kindly clarify this point as it is often taught to the students in the class. Okay, yeah, uh, no, no, I think I would agree with that. Um, the original Heisenberg gamma ray microscope uh, argument uh, is, um, is really a substitute for a better analysis which involves entanglement. A proper, uh, a proper account of the effect of, um, quote, observation, unquote, um, uh, does require uh, consideration of entanglement with the, um, the measuring device, or in uh, Heisenberg's case, the photon. Uh, I agree. Yeah. Okay, and I think uh, we go with the, uh, the last qu uh, query because uh, I'm sure this has been an exhausting experience for you. Uh, so, and that's a very simple query which says that, what is the quantity K that you would define towards the end of your slide? What is K? Okay. Uh, Professor Leggett, I think we have lost your audio connection, your connection. Polarization and polarized settings replace times of measurement. Uh, sorry, Professor Legger. So uh, sorry, Professor Legger, we lost you there. We, we, uh, could you please repeat that answer? We'd be very grateful. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. So, well, why don't I just ask the questioner? Um, is the, uh, uh, are you, the questioner, familiar with the so called CHSH theorem um, in the discussion of? Uh, Bell EPI experiments. Uh, I'm going to add, are, I, I'm going to I'm going to be presumptuous and and answer the and answer their question in the negative. 
Okay, fine. All right, so you want a um, specific, um, uh, a specific form of the quantity K. Okay, um, it's, um, it's the expectation value of Q, that is the fundamental variable, which can take values plus or minus one. Um, Q measured at time T1 times Q measured at time T2. That's the first term in K. Uh, the second term is similarly the correlation of Q at time T2 with Q at time T3. Um, the third is, uh, again, correlation of Q at time T3 and time T4. And the fourth is minus the correlation at times one and four. Um, in each case, um, what is essential is that these correlations are measured without any intermediate interference or measurement of the system between the two times in question. I'm sorry, it'd be nice to be able to actually write this down, but I'm afraid we don't have the means of doing that. So that's the best I can do. But it is in fact, the exact analog of the so-called CHSH quantity, which occurs in their famous um, inequality. Okay, I did say that was the last question, but with your permission, can we have squeeze in one more query? The, this is definitely yeah. the last one. Okay, so good. there is a query by Nandita Sudhatevari, and the query is, uh, if the pairing gap and the pseudo gap coexist, concurrence between the pairs and the SDW take place and the pseudo gap intends to decrease the superconducting transition temperature. However, at high TC, superconduct uh, the uh, the superconduct the SC phase and the pseudo gap require a strong correlation. Does this mean that the pseudo gap seems to help high TC superconductivity? Uh, I think we got to. This will be definitely the last query because there are some internet connectivity issues uh, at Professor Leggett's end. So let's hope uh, we can get this through. The answer is very simple. Right now, we don't know. Ah, okay. So the only part we got of your answer was that right now we don't know. So I think that's probably the the, the, the totality of the answer. I'm very sorry. sorry, we just don't know. <laughs> uh, frankly, we don't just don't understand high temperature superconductivity. Okay. Okay. Very good. So uh, I think with that, uh, we would uh, come to the end of the QA session. And now I would uh, request uh, um, our director uh, to, uh, to kindly say a few words. Uh, Professor Tony Leggett, <clears throat> uh, it's, it's our privilege and honor that uh, you agreed to deliver this lecture and, and that lecture has been delivered today. I think uh, from the entire IIT Wilkie family, it is my indeed a great privilege that I have to say thank you to you, a, a very, very warm thank you to you. Uh, it was my, uh, if I may say, uh, bad luck that I could not join in the, at the beginning of the lecture, uh, despite my uh, strong interest and fascination for all the uh, various topics in the mystery of universities, including yours, uh, because I, my current responsibility as the director of the institute, sometimes uh, my other engagements take priority over the academic uh, interests. And so I have to often uh, sacrifice that. And so I could not join in the beginning. And when I joined, I, I was slightly, I mean, disappointed to see the unstable internet connection. And, but I hope that the quality of the lecture and the quality of the interaction question answer session would have been extremely beneficial to the entire audience. Uh, I saw a large number of uh, people participating in this uh, lecture series, including in today's talk. It is no surprise because of the uh, kind of the topic and of course the eminence of the speaker. I um, also want to take this opportunity to thank my colleagues, uh, Prof. Alok Mishra, Prof. Anil Gauri Shetty, the entire um, physics and astronomy club of IIT Roorkee uh, for doing this very diligently, painstakingly and meticulously. And the entire team uh, deserves kudos for this. And, and it is very surprising that uh, we keep on blaming COVID and Corona and, and rightly so. But had it not been uh, COVID, I, I don't think we would have the pleasure and privilege of listening to Professor Tony Leggett. 
uh, i think uh, in some ways it has it has given us opportunities which did not exist earlier so uh, so with these words i would like to conclude and uh, thank you professor legit again for joining and hopefully when corona recedes uh, one day we'll have the opportunity of hosting you in our wonderful campus thank you thank you very much yes. thank you so much professor chaturvedi thank you so much uh, very grateful for your kind words and uh, so with this uh, professor legit uh, we again on behalf of the uh, the entire community uh, of course uh, IIT Roorkee, as Professor Chaturvedi has already said, we are so grateful to you, indebted to you, for having agreed to uh, give this inaugural lecture on this MOU series uh, this year. And um, um, thank you once again. Thank you so much. Thank you. And good luck for the series. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank I'll you. Leave. I'll, yeah, I'll leave now. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Please stay safe.